Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Panath LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. Eighteen years ago, eighteen seasons. I put together a show with, three, with four people. Two of them are here today. It's called our reunion show. It's a reunion show to talk about what's happening in real estate today and really what's happened over the past 18 years. So to reflect on that, my guests, they include Bruce Mosler, chairman of global brokerage Cushman & Wakefield. His buddy, Stephen B. Siegel, chairman global brokerage of CBRE. But both of you were once presidents of Cushman and Wakefield. So That's correct. I was saying prior to the show, when we did the show in January of 2002, live from Charlotte's Kosher Restaurant in the Sony Center, <laughs> in the building called the Sony Center, that was a building owned originally built by AT&T. Mm -hmm. What's happening in that building today? It's uh, been bought by a family from the Middle East, um, and RXR just came in as uh, maybe an equity investor, but certainly as the operating partner. It's being redesigned. They're waiting for some landmark uh, approvals, um, and it's going to be on the market uh, for office space. <clears throat> and one time it was owned by Joe Chatreed. In between, he was going to do right. condos and a hotel. But what, what, you know, we're talking about 18 years ago, and you bring up... Um, RxR, which reminds me about 18 years ago, there wasn't an RxR. No, but there was a Rexon. There was a Rexon, but also 18 years ago, there was no discussion or thoughts about the far west side. That is for sure. Okay, so let's talk about the far west side because I noticed reading some of the uh, rags, you recently just did a, a lease at a building that I worked at many years ago called 441 Ninth Avenue. Yes, sir which was a, a headquarters for a company called Hartfield Zodis and then GHI. How did a building that nobody wanted to go to on Ninth Avenue and 34th Street, where you had no restaurants with the exception of Giordano's Italian restaurant, <laughs> you, you really had nothing. Either one of you or both of you on the far west side. Because well, let's just speak to 441 and I'll talk a little bit about how yeah, it um, Both well, jump in. 441 is sort of... Uh, in the hub, out of the hub bub, so to speak. It's uh, east of uh, all the Hudson Yard developments in Manhattan West. It's an easy walk to Penn Station, and there now are numerous restaurants in the area precipitated from Manhattan West and um, Hudson Yard's development. It's funny, the building's kind of like a combination of the old and new. It's not kind of like it is. 
they've taken the existing building and maintained it, and they're going to uh, they're re redoing all the windows, restoring the original columns, being upgraded dramatically, and they're adding a 200,000 foot tower, which is virtually, uh, we topped out about two weeks ago, it's steel and glass, 14 terraces. So for the, um, the users of the traditional type of space, like the Googles and the Facebooks, and that's appealing to them, they have a combination. We did just sign a, loot, a lease for four, five, six, seven, eight, and those in the old building, and nine and 10 in the new with uh, Peloton. Um, and we have a lease out for another 100,000 feet in the building. Uh, with Is there going to be retail on the ground floor? There will be retail, and not to be announced yet, but there will be. What about the parking lot? Is the parking lot still uh, there? Some of the parking lot will still be there, but uh, um, Peloton's taking 20,000 feet of it for offices. Let's yes. talk about Manhattan West. Uh, so, yeah, so what can you say? Um, 18 years ago, we were in a different real estate yeah. landscape, Midtown still we were ruled six months after the, the roost, tragic it events. Was, it was six months after the 9-11 tragedy where we lost almost 12 million square feet of Class A office space. Believe it or not, some of our newest stock on a relative basis. So here we are 18 years later. Um, the average age of property is 75, 77 years old. And Michael Bloomberg and his administration looked at the landscape and said, where do we attract the technology tenants, how do we attract the next generation of tenancies with the average age of stock being so old? And he had the vision. He had the vision uh, for Hudson Yards, all in, if fully developed, 28.6 million square feet of commercial office space and residential on top of that. But here we are today, and there's been a shift west, Manhattan West converted 450 West 33rd Street to 5 Manhattan West, and 1.7 million square feet has been leased to the investment banking community, to the banking community, to the technology community. I don't want to go through the list of tenants, but we all know who they are. And at the end of the day, a new tower of 2.2 million square feet is 92% leased, going towards 100 very quickly. And we'll start the last phase of this four million square foot. So, so here's the question: the two live, you, work, play, development. As I, as I, I had to up say that, fact, Steve. <laughs> okay, both of you have been it's in commercial. This, He's uh, agent for that project. No, I, I realize, I, I, and his statistics are pretty easy. No, pretty good statistics. And the gateway to Hudson Yards, if I may add. Uh, no, but Penn the real, the being one block the real gateway to Hudson Yards is 441 Ninth Avenue. Correct. Okay. The real let's, gateway let's, let's is real. the real gateway is Manhattan West, which is right across the street <laughs> from the Farley site, where right eventually you'll be able to go underground all the way to Penn Station, the most traveled hub in North America. <laughs> Let, let's talk about the world, the other <laughs> phenomena that we haven't seen. Yes. Which I didn't believe that, I noticed that you recently represented WeWork, okay? What's your thoughts of the co-working space in general? Also the management concept, yes, the yes. convene idea, yes. as opposed to the industrious, I think the concept is one that's needed. I think certainly Convene and its conferencing centers, which uh, saves mainstream tenants from having as, as much space that they might otherwise use for that, and they can use Convene and the catering and everything else it does. <clears throat> uh, WeWorks is an hotel and all these, uh, um, um, what do you call it, operating co space, co-working space, is great for the millennials. My opinion is, They've exceeded the demand um, combined. I'm not pointing out we work for any one uh, entity, and I just think at some point uh, there'll be a reckoning, a day of reckoning as it relates to all that space that's leased and all the capital that's necessary to finish it out and all the, the users that they hope to find. Um, and it may be just a little bit below the Mason-Dixon line. I mean, you know. So, so may I just give the contrapoint to that because I think it's, important and I think Steve makes a very valid point that that's very much affecting our industry but I would give you three reasons that I think co-working will sustain with the, uh, the industry. With, with, with the caveat that you do some work with one of the co-working all, co all, 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 all of our firms okay. are working with the co-workers so yes in fact we do but so does CBRE at the end of the day, let's look at what the underpinnings are here and what's driving the co-working phenomenon. 
This is the first disruptor I think we've seen to the real estate service side of the business and in fact to the landlord side as well. It's the first real disruptor to our industry outside of technology in the first, I think, instance. What's driving it? First of all, gap law change. A at the end of the day, the requirement now that tenants bring their, their, their leases on balance sheet day one has made co-working attractive because of the flexibility of term that you can have. One years, three years, five years, et cetera. So co-working has moved from the millennial or the onesie twosies to, at the end of the day, enterprise tenants, meaning the major banks, the major technology companies are all availing themselves because it also provides ultimate flexibility between locations. These two things, I think, give it legs now and into the future. I'm not convinced, and, and one thing Steve said, and we will both be borne out one way or the other here, I don't know which way things will go when we see the adjustment because whatever inning we're in at this stage of the game in the real estate cycle or in the cycle for industry, it's not the middle. It's certainly not the beginning. It's certainly not the middle. It's towards the end. Do I think we have some years left? Potentially, with deregulation and other things that the administration is doing. But at the end of the day, I think co-working will do just fine in a down economy or an up economy. We'll have okay, to wait and see. Okay, Let's I say the very description, which is 100% accurate, tenants, mainstream tenants, they're now uh, accommodating them in a very big way. In some instances, competing with the very landlords that put them in their building. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that's also an issue for them eventually. That flexibility that they've allowed these tenants to have, cancellations, one, two, three years, building out space and, and tenant allowances mm -hmm. could end up haunting them at some point if these tenants get rid of that particular use, leave for other, uh, asp other locations or uh, other parts of this country altogether. And I think that's another bubble in that business. That's all. I, we competed for a, a, a tenant with with one of these uh, co-working uh, companies. Again, I'm not trying to point any single one out. And the, the, what they offered this tenant <clears throat> was a 15-year lease, the right to cancel after five years, $200 work letter, and two years free rent. Now, if that tenant canceled after five years, the cost to that entity for that deal is astronomical, tens of millions of dollars. You, pick, you roll the dice and assume they're gonna stay and grow, but that's a big role. Or if there'll be somebody behind them, Steve. At the end of the day, I would just say that the the depth and breadth of the co-working business today, given that they have moved into the enterprise side of it, is there's a very deep bench. Uh, typically, these spaces are leased before uh, the work is complete. But but no one here can say for sure. When the economy shifts, how this will affect any of us, including the co-working businesses. The reason I think they're sustainable is because the underpinnings today of what is driving financial service companies and tech businesses in their growth, which is to decentralize in some cases, to provide ultimate flexibility for their workers is favorable to the co-working business. So the, I, that's why I think it's sustainable, especially the balance sheet economics. So we'll see could be the only key, in my opinion, I'm just giving you my opinion, and there are a rising number of landlords that will not do business with them. Okay. Uh, uh, one other comment, because that's what we're here to do the, I think, the, the point counterpoint. Point counterpoint. At the end of the day, some of these landlords are gonna, some, some landlords have made the decision to compete with coworkers or to develop their own product. Or, right. not, or not lease it to them at all. Or, or, I'm or the same okay, okay. That they're but, in but danger from a others, others have made the decision that they will partner with them. And rather, rather than reinvent the or wheel. Or some of them have agreed to do the management arrangement, like industrialists yes. and convene. Well, convene is, for sure, as, as that. There, there is no convene question. Convene doesn't create. Co convene's a little different, though. Traffic. It's a very different company. Co convene yeah. is a little different. They're let's, more of an amenitization let's for the property. Let's get to another topic. Point. Right. That 18, makes 18 years ago, there was a company called Amazon who basically was in the book business. Yes. Now we have Amazon, we have Google, we have Facebook, we have all these fang companies opening up in New York. How do you see the change with regard to both residential, which you also know, and the office world? Where do you see that? Uh, Amazon didn't pioneer this. 
They've clearly exactly said right. they're establishing a new beachhead here yes. because they've run out of labor force. They're transporting people from San Francisco and elsewhere to the Silicon Valley. People who want to live there can't afford to live there, so they've decided labor is always a big driving force. Public transportation here, so access to affordable. I'm, I'm not questioning, but my question is, how do you see that affect yeah. the office space out of Manhattan? Okay, if they, if they grow rapidly enough, and there's not a, a sufficient space here, there's no reason why they wouldn't yeah, go to a yeah, Brooklyn. There's no reason why, obviously, Amazon chose uh, Long Island City, but they also have what close to a million feet here. You have more, you more, have more. They have more. They, they they probably have in Manhattan close to a million and a half, maybe two million feet. But but Steve's right. It, it, look, your question is, thus far what we've seen in Long Island City and Brooklyn in particular, and, and let's leave the Gold Coast out of this, the Jersey waterfront out of this, what we've seen in Brooklyn is mostly local growth, right? We haven't seen the big players go there. And with the exception of Citicorp, which pioneered Long Island City, we really haven't seen a major player of consequence in the fan wait, community. Wait a second, commitment. but we don't see other players. So far, I don't see. so far, but what Steve said what? is right. The, the major players are going to run out of growth opportunity in New York in the very near future in terms of the hip and cool space. Park Avenue South has the tightest vacancy in America, right? And if you're looking to major floor plates, in the city, short of new development, you're going to begin to look in Long Island City at this well, point. Why can't somebody, why can't one of these companies do what uh, Spotify did and go down to the world? Well, some they of can. them will. No, some of them they will. Can. Some of them will have to go to Main Street they buildings. Can. If they want to stay in Manhattan, there's not going to be enough of this type of unique space that they like. Google's in the process of maybe taking another million square feet of that type of space. Yep. Bringing them to what three and a half, almost four million. million. Uh, absolutely. That's, this is a million. They have 111 Eighth Avenue. They have uh, 85 Tenth Avenue. I mean, they've they have numerous amount of tentacles out there. Facebook's in the market for 800,000 square feet. So what about the other far west west side where the spiral is okay. and the other you got property? The spiral and you got the uh, Moynihan BP building, which will now get built. And uh, there's uh, there are other opportunities. Listen. There was one time that that was going to be a jet stadium. Well, uh, you know, to, that's exactly right. And Doctorov was championing the, that location. That's right. For just that, and everybody said, "quote unquote," way too much traffic. Eight Sundays a year, way too much traffic. And now we have, as Bruce said, millions, tens of millions of feet of office space, that's, and another eleven high-rise condominium that's right. apartments. Uh, listen, and Neiman Marcus and uh, uh, Hudson Yards in general, Manhattan West and Hudson Yards. We've already seen built. 10 plus million square feet with another two coming online very shortly and there'll be more beyond that. So the far west side is, or Midtown West as we call it, is established and it's gonna, and by the way, it's established not just as an office player but also as a retail uh, venue. It's connection to the High Line, it's 24 seven live, work, play. Every big restaurateur is moving or adding a location, yeah. Midtown West. Danny Meyer just said he's moving towards uh, Midtown West and in announced. particular Manhattan West, just announced. Yeah. So announced. every great restaurateur wants to have a location there given the population well, the that will be there. It's enormous. It's, it's, it's enormous. Well, it's gonna be the same in Long Island City. Amazon makes a commitment like that. Oh my God, be sorry. sure there'll be follow up to that. That will open up the floodgates. Very good for the, the city. The problem with Long Island City is most of the buildings that are available now are conversions or sites that have to be built. That's right. Amazon is all over most of them. I mean, yes. the space they took at the City Corp Tower is- That's just, that's just that's a, that's a tip marker. of the iceberg. Right? That's a marker. Uh, what we're both not saying, but I think it's, it's maybe the pioneer of why all this product, and Bruce said it first and correctly, 70 years old or older, there's a flight to quality yeah. and in efficiency. There are tenants that's, with that's right. seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand feet that move to five or six hundred thousand feet in new product. Then operating costs are pretty much the same, but the efficiency of the space, the collaborative space. What about the Mitanis uh, rezoning? What's your thoughts about I that? I believe there's a lot of, uh, is, I know there's an enormous amount of activity because I'm doing on a pro bono basis uh, the negotiation for the sale of some air rights for uh, a synagogue. And there are. He's a very lives. religious man, my brother. Yes, <laughs> I'm a holy man. Yeah. Uh, there are several, In there a way. Are several interested buyers, 
and there are probably four or five million square feet of proposed projects on the east side. What about or, the what, former Fisher Brothers site on, uh, you know, near um, NYU Langone? It's one site that's commercial. that he's talking about building a million square foot building, not on spec, but the rest are residential. The one comment I'll make is twofold. First, on the east side rezoning. One is, when you get through the economics, it's not so simple, because you are talking about pricey air rights, or let's just say they're priced right, but you have to factor in the air tear rights down. Is, uh, the price. The, the price is the price, but factor in the teardown, the redevelopment, the costs. When you're all said and done. The relocation of the tenant. All, all the, the tenant. above, the economics are pretty steep versus what's in the pipeline now, Midtown West or downtown. Brookfield yes. is going to redevelop 666 yes. Fifth Avenue. Not the east side, but the Rockefellers did 1271. Enormous success. Enormous yeah. success. And uh, A little different than than some of the other sites we're talking about, but your point about yeah, no, being, I'm saying they took it there's a the disparity between some that have been laying the plans to redevelop and those that will have to go through the whole process. Wait, what's the views of each one of you on retail in, in Manhattan? Retail has to be redefined. It has to be a, a reason people go to destination and come off of e-commerce. What they have to do, and they're already doing it, they're, they're making it a place people want to go. There will be food, they'll be joining you know, a, a Starbucks and a, and a retail store. They're going to do drop off and pick up a package that you've ordered. If you want to return something, you go. While you're returning it, and the store is there with things to shop at. It's funny, Time Warner Center, which initially was a, 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 a center in trouble, a vertical, multi tenant People questioned whether but you could do it. Now with the restaurants. Unbelievable. The Jazz at Lincoln Center. People have enormous other reasons the to go there. The tenancy has shop. changed significantly over the 14 years. In Time yes. Warner Center. In Time Warner yeah, Center. Credit worthy yes. tenants that yes. now know the demographic yes. warrant their occupancy. Yes, and, and retail has changed in Midtown pretty dramatically in those 18 years as well, right? I Just mean, Fifth Avenue point, is Athletic City. Look, retail has been affected more so than perhaps any other industry by technology. And yes. with, <clears throat> with, with the advent of the online business, so has retail changed. I believe retail in New York has bottomed out now. There had to be some, I think, reconciliation when you were seeing retail rents rise as dramatically as you were. And I want to hasten that. I am no retail expert. So I wish Joanne Podell were sitting in the seat talking about retail change. But in the end analysis, common sense says when retail rents were escalating so quickly, yeah. and at the same moment in time, the business, if you will, dynamic was changing, it had to reconcile. The key stores. confluence between rising retail rents and e-commerce kind of sort of met in the middle. And if you want to post a child for that, take a look at the Polo store on Fifth Avenue, yeah, which is shut after two years. Their rent is $900,000 a month, and it was cheaper for them to close it than to keep it open because the retail traffic was so low and the labor costs to keep it open, the hours that it needed to be, made that exposure even worse than paying rent in an empty store. Well, and, and without sort of the technology, the way that, that businesses sort of branded themselves, I'm thinking of certain retailers, was to be on every block. They no longer have to do that to brand, so they're not doing that. I'm actually an optimist because I think things have adjusted now. I think that high street retail will continue to succeed on Fifth and Madison, but we're also, to Steve's point, those retailers that don't make it experiential at the end of the day are going to have problems because no one carries inventory. They don't need to. So you've got to show your wares, and at the end of the day, show the product so that people can come in and pick it, and it'll eventually be sent to your house in 24 hours. The bottom line is, well, therefore, the store has to be experienced. If you want to be my daughter, it's sent to four hours. There's places like pret a or whatever it's called, that she can pick up. They'll send over six dresses, literally. And she can try them on and call them up. They'll pick up five of them. What do you think of the Bronx? I think the Bronx is... Uh, Bronx site. It's... I mean, it's on fire, but I think that fire will uh, flame out a number of uh, projects. It's on fire for residential right now. 
And also commercial. There's a sale just about to close for the old post office. I know about that. 90,000 square feet. There are, there are LOIs out for the tenants. There's a, a buyer that's going to contract if it hasn't already. It was two days ago or three days ago. It was getting close. So there are, there are office developments. Residential, I wouldn't... What about uh, one Vanderbilt? It's enjoying it's some be a success. Great success. Uh, be a great it's a success. gorgeous, gorgeous building. Um, yep. it was, I thought the location would be somewhat harder to overcome, and I was, I'm was pleased that it wasn't. And there's some name tenants and some big rents being paid. I think the whole commitment by J.P. Morgan to remain in place... It's big. ...has been huge for Midtown in general, but, but certainly been very beneficial for one Vanderbilt. <clears throat> it's an exciting building. It's, it's going to be a great success. It's almost over the hump, and at the end of the day, it represents, I think, the best in new construction that we have to offer. And as Steve said, people are relocating at the end of the day for efficiencies. Every business today is, get, is, is in shrink mode, but for the tech businesses, the FANG businesses, those folks are net absorption looking to the future, I think that's going to continue. So my shiny crystal apple. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Can we take that home? No. You can't um, take anything home. You can't take yeah. anything home. I don't even have right. a t-shirt. You're right. It's going to be shinier. <laughs> okay. You can take home. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> you can take home the, 15, the mugs. We can take years. the mugs? 18 years. You haven't had a no. t-shirt. No. No. Yeah. no. I'd like to thank my two. A handkerchief. My, my, reu yeah, no my reunion guests over there. <laughs> Bruce Mosler and Steve Siegel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you next week. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael.